Hi everybody, Micah Hanks here. Glad to be a part of this year's All the Strange event. Hopefully it'll be the first of many. And so right here at the outset, I just want to thank Jason for getting us all together and uh, making this happen. I'm afraid maybe that uh, online events are going to become the new norm, at least for a while. And so what better way for us to all get together? But let's dive right into things because again, for those who may have followed my work or know who I am, Again, I'm probably best known for writing about UFOs and doing podcasting about that for the last decade or so. But really, for as long, really, as I can remember, I have been fascinated with the idea of Sasquatch. This is an interest that goes all the way back to childhood for me. Although, with time, as I have continued to follow it, and I have become more and more scientifically inclined... It's really become an issue for me to try and bring a scientific and historical approach to the study of topics like Sasquatch, and the same applies to things like UFOs too. And so today I really want to try and look at both some of the ethnological and the anthropological perspectives in terms of the idea of Sasquatch in North America, and also whether or not there is any evidence in the historical record for these creatures. One of the arguments against their existence that is often made is, well, in addition to there not being enough physical evidence, there would have to be evidence in the historical record, and there simply isn't any, so Sasquatch couldn't exist. Well, I actually differ, and so today we're going to look at some of the historical evidence that I think may actually support the existence of creatures like this. And so I want to break this down into essentially a couple of areas. We'll look at indigenous American traditions, and some which I think may actually relate to what we know today as Sasquatch, and then historical accounts beginning in the 19th century and moving on into the early 20th century that I think are very noteworthy in terms of early accounts that explicitly describe large anthropoid apes in America. So let's dig in. Going to the slides right here, where I think I'd like to start today is with indigenous American folklore, which I've broken down into three categories. The first one deals with a group of large Arctic hominoids that exist in many different indigenous American traditions. They have different names as well. The one we will use today is the Tornit. The second group involves legends about cannibals and giants, an area where we really have to tread carefully because I don't think all of those sorts of legends necessarily apply to what we're talking about today, Sasquatch, which we'll discuss a little further later. And then the final group involves references to beings in Native American folklore, which to me do sound very much like our modern concept of Sasquatch. And really, I think it's always a wise idea to tread lightly and always proceed with caution when it comes to interpretation of myths and folklore. But in some of the instances, as you'll see, I also think that there's a pretty good case to be made that some of these myths and traditions do represent knowledge of an extant species. And really, plenty more could be said about what folklorists do, how they do it, the things they try to avoid— but for our purposes here, I just want to offer a couple of quotes before we get into some of these myths. And the first actually comes not from a folklorist, but from a physicist, William R. Corliss, who's been a real influence on my own work, and a guy who throughout his life was a proponent of the scientific study of the anomalous. And on the subject of myths and legends, Corliss wrote that, quote, When myths and legends are persistent and nearly universal, they may have some factual substance. True, one has no stone artifact in hand or ancient skull in a museum tray to study, but myths may contain intentional messages propagated throughout the ages by word of mouth. Distortion, exaggeration, and outright fabrication are hazards to be expected, as is the possibility of independent invention of similar stories. But all sciences have their pitfalls, and stones and bones are not free of contention. The other quote I'd like to share right here at the outset is from historian Benjamin Olshin, who writes that, quote, The concept of a much more traditional organic mode of knowledge transmission is important to the historian because it means that one must look at myths and other kinds of stories and narratives in a new way. Since those were the bearers of knowledge for far longer than our present methods of formal pedagogy, textbooks, and instruction manuals. He goes on to say, early technical or scientific knowledge is encoded in myth, folklore, epic, or ritual for the purposes of preservation and transmission. But then the myth, folklore, epic, or ritual becomes separated from its content. The mode of transmission survives, but the content is lost and the myth, folklore, or epic comes to be seen as pure fiction, and the ritual continues to be engaged in but empty of meaning.' 
Sometimes this can happen even to an archaeological site. For example, the ritual surrounding Stonehenge has become lost, and the meaning of the structure itself is now unclear. So that ends his quote, and even though he is applying that in the example he gives to an archaeological site, here I think it also remains true that while we may not have the full story, parts of that may have been lost to time, some of the myths and stories we'll look at may nonetheless convey some important information that science really should pay attention to. So we'll get over to the legends now. I want to start with a excerpt by the legendary ethnologist Franz Boas from his book The Central Eskimo, and this was published in 1888, and he gives us the following classic account, as I call it, about these large hominids that existed in the northern regions known as the Tornit. And he writes, In olden times the Inuit were not the only inhabitants of the country in which they live at the present time. Another tribe similar to them shared their hunting ground, but they were on good terms, both tribes living in harmony in the villages. The Tornit were much taller than the Inuit and had very long arms and legs. Almost all of them were blear-eyed. They were extremely strong and could lift large boulders, which were by far too heavy for the Inuit. But even the Inuit of that time were much stronger than those of today, and some large stones are shown on the plain of Miljaquin in Cumberland Sound, with which the ancient Inuit used to play, throwing them great distances. Even the strongest men of the present generations are scarcely able to lift them, much less to swing them or throw them any distance. Boaz goes on to describe the way that the Tornit dressed, talking about the long coats of deerskin that they wore. And quite obviously, the Sasquatch, as we know it today, is not something that is generally best known for his style of clothing. And in my opinion, these reports actually do not describe the Sasquatch that we're looking for evidence for. And so my reason for bringing this to the table as we begin the analysis of indigenous American folklore really takes us back to paleoanthropology, as I already mentioned, the single species hypothesis that was once so popular among anthropologists really is no longer considered the most viable hypothesis. And we have an abundance of evidence now that modern Homo sapiens sapiens actually did live alongside Neanderthals as well as Denisovans. And let's not forget, in terms of the ghost DNA I referenced earlier, there are also unrecognized species for which we find genetic traces in our own modern DNA, but which we haven't identified in the fossil record. So back in the Pleistocene during the last ice age, there were in fact several different species that coexisted. And for this reason, as more and more information has begun to emerge about this, some archeologists have decided to begin their search for answers about the Sasquatch mystery with those known species. Back in 1983, archaeologist Myra Shackley wrote a fantastic book called Still Living, and as the name would seem to imply, she was looking at the possibility, especially in modern Russia and parts of Eurasia, at whether or not some members of the Neanderthal species might have stuck around until recent times. And of course, when she wrote that book, we didn't know yet about the Denisovans in the Altai of Russia. We didn't know about the genetic studies that would follow decades later that would show other examples, which we haven't even identified yet. We didn't know about Homo floresiensis down there on the island of Flores, the so-called hobbits down there, which some actually argue may be more closely related to a species like Homo erectus, but we won't get into that right now. The point is, at the time that Shackley wrote her book, she was exploring, or I should say building a hypothesis around, what was known in science at that time. But nowadays, we've discovered other options, and we have a lot more to work with. And so coming back to the Tornit in these indigenous traditions, if we were to say that the Neanderthal or the Denisovans or another group not only persisted far longer than we expected, but might have even made their way across the Bering Land Bridge toward the end of the Pleistocene or at some point, and that even a small number of them cohabitated for some time alongside humans in North America, these legends of the so-called Tornit might make more sense. And further, if there had been cousins to humanity that coexisted along early indigenous Americans, perhaps we shouldn't rule out the possibility that they weren't the only cousins that were living in the northernmost climes. Perhaps there were, or even still are, other species to be considered. Now, that brings us to our second group here, which is cannibals, giants, and another term that we're going to look at in this portion of the talk is the Wendigo or the Wittico, as they are known in different indigenous American groups. 
The Wendigo actually represents cannibalism, essentially, and the ethnological interpretation of what a Wendigo is is essentially a cultural mythology that is a story built onto the horrors of cannibalism, which helps serve, in effect, as a sort of preventative against it. But if we look at Native American legends of giants, there are a variety of different kinds that show up. Sometimes there are just giant humans. Sometimes there are what are called stone giants. Some giants are described as having scales. Some are described as having several heads. And if we look at all the different shapes and the different forms that giants take in indigenous mythology, I think it would really be a stretch to try and say that every story involving a giant is actually a story about a Sasquatch. I really actually don't think that's the case at all. Nor do I think that all stories of Wendigos or cannibals necessarily have anything to do with Sasquatch. However, there are some instances, I think, where those connections should be explored based on descriptions that are given. One example that comes to mind is Joseph E. Guinard's uh, article from back in 1930 that appeared in the journal Primitive Man, and this was titled Whitico Among the Tete de Boule, and he's talking about a California indigenous American group who have a number of different traditions about the Whitico. And I want you to keep in mind as we're going through these legends as I give you the date of publication, you'll note that most of these are from the early part of the last century. That's going to be significant a little later when we start getting into historical accounts that may describe Sasquatch. But Guinard gives us the following account of the Wittico according to the Tete de Boule, and this being an Algonquin-speaking people of the upper St. Morris River in Quebec. And he describes the Wittico as their most famous monster. He says they've never been numerous. At most, one or two of them wander around the country, and this only from time to time. Sometimes there are none around for many years. According to the Tete de Boule, the Witticos were people possessed with the devil. But in all cases, before becoming Witticos, these possessed individuals had been powerful jongleurs, terrible and ferocious sorcerers. He goes on to talk about how they will fight one another to the death if they ever meet. They are solitary and they always travel the country by themselves. He says the Wittico wore no clothing, summer and winter he went naked, and he never suffered cold. He goes on to also say the Wittico had no lips, and that essentially it was just a mouth with teeth barred all the time. Now that doesn't sound very much like a Sasquatch, does it? Again, we should really be careful in interpreting every myth or legend as being evidence of Sasquatch. But at this point, Gennard's narrative begins to shift a little and it starts giving us some very interesting details. Uh, he mentions, similar to the legends about the Tornet being blear-eyed, or presumably meaning that they had red eyes or eyes that looked as though they'd been crying, here Gennard reports that the Wittico has eyes that were big and rolled in blood. They were something like owl's eyes, which is also interesting because in certain American Indian legends, the Sasquatch or presumed creature that some associate with Sasquatch is actually referred to as the Owl Woman. This could have something to do with the appearance of the eyes. Gennard also describes that the feet of the Wittico were extremely long, although strangely he says that the tracks that they leave only appear to have one large toe. He says the voice of the Witticos were strident and frightful and more reverberating than thunder. The sound of his voice was a long drawn out one accompanied by fearful howls. And with those howls in mind, I would actually like to interject at this point a bit of audio of a purported Sasquatch howl that was recorded on Vancouver Island in just the last couple of years. So there you have an alleged Sasquatch howl. At very least, it is some kind of a howl that cannot be identified. For all we know, it could be a Sasquatch hunter calling to Sasquatch rather than actually being a Sasquatch. But that howl you just heard, according to some, is the sort of sound that they make. And that seems to actually match the account in this legend. But now this is one of the most interesting parts in the account Gennard gives us. He says also that the food the Wittico ate was rotten wood, swamp moss, mushrooms, corpses, and human flesh. Well, that's natural since Wendigos are believed to be cannibals, right? But he also says... When a Whitico happened upon the trail of anyone, he waited until darkness fell to go eat the luckless victim. When the Whitico had arrived close to the tent of his victim, his heart beat twice with joy upon his breast, making a sound like that which grouse make when they drum. Now, there are a lot of references to 
the idea of Sasquatch or Wendigos and the various cultural variants in different myths and folklore making a sound similar to a grouse. And a lot of researchers have interpreted that to mean the whistling sound or the call a grouse makes. But actually, if you've ever watched a grouse in the forest, they do what's called drumming, where they beat their wings very quickly, and it sounds almost like a little drum roll. You might also liken that to the sound that great apes make when they beat their chest. And in fact, a similar description appears of all places in a book called The Curve of Time, which was written by M. Wiley Blanchett. I think the book was written maybe in the 1940s, uh, but it took place in the 1920s, and she was a widowed mother who took her children in a boat and sailed all along the west coast of Canada and went and visited different little villages and things along those lines. And at one point in the book, which has nothing to do at all with Sasquatch, although it does make a reference to seeing a carving of the so-called Zonkwa, which is the famous wild woman of the forest that's represented in some of the Pacific Northwestern tribes, but at one point, as Blanchett describes in the book, she and her children were having dinner with an old hunter who described having to stay in a cave all night one evening with his back up against the wall and with his shotgun across his knees because of two great big bears that walked around on their hind legs outside of the cave all night and beat their chest like gorillas. Well, I've got news for you. Grizzly bears don't do that. There is no American bear species that does that. It's a very interesting description, especially in light of some of the things that appear in the ethnological literature. Which brings us finally to the myths and legends. This is our third portion here. Uh, those which actually do describe something more like a Sasquatch. Not some sort of a cannibal giant, not some sort of a supernatural monster. No, the accounts we'll look at here are generally human-like beings, but much larger, covered in hair, often accompanied by a strong odor, and which generally move around at night. And there are other common themes which include kidnappings and things along those lines too. But the first account I want to share here was written by George Gibbs. And this was first written in July of 1865, and it appeared in a manuscript by Gibbs, which the ethnologist Ella Clark describes as, quote, very probably the earliest extensive study of the religion and mythology of the Indians of Old Oregon and the earliest collection of their folk tales. And he talks about what are known as the Siakto or the Siatic. And this is a term that actually many different bands in the Pacific Northwest used in reference to what were known as stick Indians or wild men or women. And so Gibbs' account is as follows. He writes, One other race of beings I have classed separately, and I should note here he's distinguishing them from supernatural beings that he's already written about. So he's classing these separately, uh, quote, as they in particular are supposed to infest the earth and do not appear to have been properly the Eliptilicum, again referencing these supernatural beings he'd already talked about. These, he says, are Siatko in the upper Chehalis, Staetatl in the Klikatat, Shea. The belief in these beings is apparently universal among the different tribes, though there is a great discrepancy in their accounts of them. By some, the Siat Ko are described as of gigantic size, their feet 18 inches long and shaped like a bear's. Now, if you've ever looked at a bear's footprint, especially the bear's hind paw, it can at times look very much like a human's foot, with the exception of, of course, the claws, which leave indentations in the mud. But he says, the Siat Ko wear no clothes, but the body is covered with hair like that of a dog, only not so thick. Others describe them as of natural size and resembling men, except that they gibber and chatter, one Siat Ko making enough noise to represent a dozen persons. They are said to live in the mountains in holes underground and to smell badly. They come down chiefly in the fishing season, at which time the Indians are excessively afraid of them. At the report of Siat Ko, they all run for their houses, fire their guns, and shout. They are visible only at night at which time they approach the houses, steal salmon, carry off young girls, and smother children. Their voices are like those of the owl. Here again that reference to the owl. And they possess the power of charming so that others hearing them become demented or fall down in a swoon. The Klikitat informed me that they did not believe they were Eliptilicum, or of the demon race, but came afterward, and that part of them are still men and dwell beyond the mountains where they hunt and are very hospitable while... The others steal at night. They are sometimes seen spearing fish themselves. Now, of course, as with most 
ethnological representations in indigenous traditions involving what may or may not be Sasquatches, we've got a bit of a mixed bag there. It would be hard to imagine Sasquatches spearing fish or mesmerizing people with their calls. Although if we stop for a moment and we imagine a nocturnal species that behaves very much like humans, but which are a little different and perhaps more beastly and frightening, one can easily imagine the way that supernatural characteristics might be attributed to them. And that's even more the case if we consider the fact that even today, people in North America essentially still do that. Many who, for lack of any better explanation for how in the world these creatures continue to evade scientists if they actually exist, gravitate toward a paranormal explanation. Well, they must be able to step through dimensions. They must be able to come and go as they please. There's something supernatural about them. So if we still do that today, it's not out of the realm of the possible that various cultures throughout time have done that and that such beliefs are actually projected onto what may indeed actually be a physical species. Now, in the interest of time, I think we've really only got room for one more account in this area. And I want to uh, use this one because I think this is a good bridge between uh, myth and folklore and then historical accounts. This one also dates even earlier, in fact, than George Gibbs' account. This actually was written by Elkanah Walker, who was a missionary writing from Fort Colville in 1840. And this is an excerpt from a letter that he wrote where he is describing what he calls some of the superstitions among the Spokane Indians. And this is what he writes. They believe in the existence of a race of giants which inhabit a certain mountain off to the west of us. This mountain is covered with perpetual snow. They inhabit its top. They may be classed with goldsmiths nocturnal class as they cannot see in the daytime. They hunt and do all their work at night. They are men-stealers. They come to the people's lodges in the night when the people are asleep and put them under their skins and take them to the place of their abode without their even waking. When they awake in the morning, they are wholly lost, not knowing in what direction their home is. The account the Indians give of these giants will in some measure correspond with the Bible account of such a race of beings. They say their track is about a foot and a half long. They will carry two or three beams upon their back at once. They frequently come in the night, steal their salmon from the nets, and eat them raw. If the people are away, they always know when these beings are near by their strong smell, which is most intolerable. It is not uncommon for them to come in the night and give three whistles. Then the stones will begin to hit the houses. The people are troubled with their nocturnal visits. So there you have the famous account given by Elkana Walker. And among the tropes that begin to emerge in all these different accounts are, again, they steal salmon, sometimes they steal people, they whistle, they're often nocturnal, and they're larger than humans. And as George Gibbs explicitly states, they're covered in hair all over the body like a dog, but with hair not as thick as a dog's. And that brings us to historical accounts, because it has been argued by some that any descriptions of Sasquatch prior to the 1950s actually only describe very large Indians, giant Native Americans, essentially. And some time ago, I bought a book that has a fantastic cover, by the way. It's absolutely great. It's called Abominable Science. It's a skeptical interpretation of cryptozoology. And, you know, again, I think it's important to balance your reading list. Don't just read books that are pro-Sasquatch. You know, get a good perspective from a skeptic. But one issue I do have with what the authors of that book, Donald Prothero and Daniel Loxton, argue is that no reports of Sasquatch described gorilla-like or ape-like beings that prior to the early or mid-1950s, legends about Sasquatch referred explicitly to giant Indians and that there were no stories about hair-covered monsters or anything along those lines. That's a modern invention that ends up being tagged on to Sasquatch legends starting in the 1950s. Well, I would dispute that, and I'm about to offer some evidence for it, but I think as we proceed, we should also remember that the word Sasquatch was not the original word used by any indigenous Americans for these creatures. There were many different languages spoken by the different bands, and hence there were many different names for what seemed to be similar creatures. And it had actually been a man from Ireland who coined the term Sasquatch, as far as we know. His name was J.W. Burns. He came from Ireland to America. And he became a government agent and was actually a teacher on the Chehalis Reservation. And beginning in the 1920s, J.W. Burns started publishing articles that were based on stories he'd heard and interviews he had done with some of the Native Americans that he lived alongside. 
And I believe the first of those articles appeared in McLean's magazine in Canada. And some of the descriptions in that article do describe what sound more like giant Indians. The so-called Sasquatch, as he began calling them, actually at times were able to speak. Some of the members of the Chehalis actually said that they spoke a dialect that they recognized called the Douglas dialect. And so you do see some things in there that are very unlike our modern conception of Sasquatch. And we'll come back around to J.W. Burns and that article in a moment, but just keep that in mind. Again, Sasquatch is not an indigenous American word. That's one that was created by a guy from Ireland, which was based loosely on different variants that he had heard in different Pacific Northwestern Indian languages. Now, the first account I actually want to share here is from 1870, and this is from California. This appeared in the San Francisco Examiner, and the article is titled, California Gorillas. Now, in my opinion, that's a really great article to start with if we're looking for evidence of references to things like Sasquatch that describe them as resembling gorillas prior to the 1950s. And this clip actually is in response to an article that had appeared a few days earlier, and I'll share just a little of this here. It reads, An old hunter who vouches for the truth of his story writes to the Antioch Ledger averring that the statement about a gorilla having been seen among the mountains at the head of Orestrimba Creek and in Crow Canyon is strictly true. He says, I positively assure you that this gorilla or wild man or whatever you choose to call it is no myth. I know that it exists and that there are at least two of them having seen them both at once not a year ago. Their existence has been reported at times for the past 20 years, and I have heard it said that in early days an orangutan escaped from a ship on the southern coast, and this is significant, he says, but the creature I have seen is not that animal, and if it is, where did it get its mate? Now the article goes on, and it also recaps the original account, which I'll briefly summarize here. This gentleman had been camping in a rugged area of California, and had noticed while he was out hunting in the daytime that something had been disturbing his campsite. And it would do it also at night sometimes while he was asleep. And so one evening he decides to go hide back in a thicket and watch the campsite while the fire is burning and see what is coming into the campsite and causing the disturbance. And he also describes seeing footprints. And so we'll pick up the narrative there. He says, although my bedding and traps and little stores were not disturbed that I could see, I was anxious to learn what or who it was that so regularly visited my camp, for clearly the half-burned sticks and cinders could not scatter themselves about. I saw no tracks near the camp as the hard ground covered with dry leaves would show none, so I started on a circle round the place and 300 yards off in deep sand I struck the track of a man's feet, as I supposed, bare and of immense size. So needless to say, he wants to see who this barefooted giant was, and so he goes and he hides, as we described. He says, I took a position on a hillside some 60 or 70 yards from the fire and securely hid in the brush. I waited and I watched. Two hours or more I sat there and wondered if the owner of the bare feet would come again and whether he imagined what an interest he had created in my inquiring mind and finally what possessed him to be prowling around there with no shoes on. The fireplace was on my right and the spot where I saw the tracks was on my left. He says, It was in this direction that my attention was mostly directed, thinking the visitor would appear there and besides it was easier to sit and face that way. Suddenly I was startled by a shrill whistle such as boys produce with two fingers under their tongue, and turning quickly I ejaculated, Good God! as I saw the object of my solicitude standing beside the fire, erect and looking suspiciously around. You've got to really appreciate the colorful language in accounts from this era. Remember, 1870, ladies and gents. It was in the image of man, but it could not have been human. I never was so benumbed with astonishment before. The creature, whatever it was, stood fully five feet high, so it's not very large if it is a Sasquatch, right? But he says, and disproportionately broad and square at the shoulders with arms of great length. The legs were very short and the body long. The head was small compared with the rest of the creature and appeared to be set upon its shoulders without a neck. The whole was covered with dark brown and cinnamon-colored hair, quite long on some parts, that on the head standing in a shock and growing close down to the eyes. And he goes on to give further details, but essentially... How better to describe a Sasquatch? Now, some may say, well, you know, he says it was only five feet tall. Sasquatch is supposed to be giant. But we should also remember that, you know, humans come in various sizes, too. I'm sure anyone listening here has throughout their life known people who were barely five feet tall and some who exceeded seven. So if we're talking about something human-like, perhaps that same sort of variation in height would occur here, too. Now, in the interest of time, we've got to skip ahead to some additional reports. The next few are newspaper items that appeared in 
British Columbia, and in Oregon in the year 1904. I would dare say there was a bit of a flap going on around that time. This first one is dated March 25th, 1904. It appeared in the Capitol Journal in Salem, Oregon, under the headline, Wild Man in Coos County. It's said to be seven feet tall, strong as an ox. Now, this one seems to be a little more on par as far as the height. And the description given is a wild man is reported in the mountains of Coos County. He is described as seven feet tall, muscular, and unkempt. He has been terrorizing the ranchers and miners until today. They are discussing an organized hunt. He has been shot at twice without effect. He is believed to be an insane prospector of gigantic stature. Hardly a relict hominoid, right? But not so fast, because just five days later, we have the next piece, which appeared in the Capitol Journal, this one in Salem, Oregon as well, The Sixes Wild Man Again, Harry being who is horror of the miners. He hurls four-pound rocks through the air like baseballs. The article reads, The appearance again of the wild man of the Sixes has thrown some of the miners into a state of excitement and fear. A report says the wild man has been seen three times since the 10th of last month. The first appearance occurred on Thompson Flat. William Ward and a young man by the name of Burleson were sitting by the fire of their cabin one night when they heard something walking around the cabin, which resembled a man walking, and when it came to the corner of the cabin, it took hold of the corner and gave the building a vigorous shake and kept up a frightful noise all the time. The same that has so many times warned the venturesome miners of the approach of the hairy man and caused them to flee in abject fear. Now our description's a little more on point. We have the following account here, this one from July of the same year. The Morning Astorian, July 7th, 1904. This is from Astoria, Oregon. The title of this piece, Wild Man of the Forest. Hairy creature seen by lone traveler in British Columbia. So a little further north. But as they report here, a weird story of a wild man encountered far inland from the headwaters of Campbell River is told by Mike King, who had penetrated into a territory religiously shunned by Indians, none of whom would either accompany him, as usual, nor make the explanation of their conduct. King had been making his solitary way through the forest, not having seen a human face for days, when a cry of mingled surprise and fear, very human in its quality and foreign in the forest land, brought him to a sudden halt, rifle in hand and his eyes straining for an explanation. This was quickly afforded, but in such a manner as to try the nerves of even such a woodsman as Mike King. About a hundred yards from where he stood, or even less, an uncouth human faced him, seemingly all certain whether to stand or fly. The form was that of a large and angular man completely covered with hair, and long arms hanging loosely and hands reaching below the knees. The eyes were quick and penetrating, shining strangely through a tangle of unkempt hair. The object was unmistakably and uncompromisingly human, Mr. King attests, and yet no human being such as any nation, tribe, or country knows. Quite a description. And there were others from that year. I've got another here from December of 1904, just simply entitled The Wild Man, reporting that he's been seen by many in the northern woods. So in the year of 1904, there were a lot of similar reports that were coming in of these things, and some, yes, described them as gorilla-like. Skipping ahead to 1924, we had a much more famous incident which involves a group of prospectors in an area appropriately called Ape Canyon who claim that their cabin is attacked. And in the various newspaper reports from around that time that described the incident, they refer to these seven-foot-tall giants as being gorilla-like. So quite obviously, there were a lot of references to large, gorilla-like, but essentially anthropoid apes in parts of the Pacific Northwest, some of which not only predated the 1950s, they actually went even further back, as that first report from 1870 in California shows us. But now, before we wrap up, I want to return again to the article I referenced earlier by J.W. Burns from April 1929, introducing British Columbia's hairy giants. And in Burns' article, he describes an incident where a couple of berry pickers walking along a railroad track allegedly encountered a naked giant that terrified them. And so he inquired about this incident to see if it was indeed true, and he received a letter which he quotes in his article from this gentleman, Mr. Point, who had been one of the observers. And I will now quote the description he gives in the letter he sent to J.W. Burns, which appeared in that article. He says, Dear Sir, I have your letter asking, is it true or not that I saw a hairy giant man at Agassiz last September while picking hops there? Now, again, keep in mind, he refers to him explicitly at the beginning as a hairy giant. Okay, In this article, the first to present to the world the term Sasquatch, again, if some skeptics are to be believed, there shouldn't have been references to hairy, gorilla-like creatures prior to the 1950s. 
So right here at the outset, Mr. Point describes a hairy giant. Let's see how his description holds up thereafter. He says, It is true, and the facts are as follows. This happened at the close of September 1927 when we were having a feast. Adeline August and myself walked to her father's orchard, which is about four miles from the hop fields. We were walking on the railroad track and within a short distance of the orchard when the girl noticed something walking along the track coming toward us. I looked up but paid no attention to it as I thought it was some person on his way to Agassiz. But as he came closer we noticed that his appearance was very odd and on coming still closer we stood still and were astonished seeing that the creature was naked and covered with hair like an animal. Okay, covered with hair like an animal, he says. We were almost paralyzed from fear. I picked up two stones with which I intended to hit him if he attempted to molest us, but within fifty feet or so he stood up and looked at us. He was twice as big as the average man, with hands so long that they almost touched the ground. It seemed to me that his eyes were very large, and that the lower part of his nose was wide and spread over the greater part of his face, which gave the creature such a frightful appearance that I ran away as fast as I could. After a minute or two I looked back and saw that he resumed his journey. The girl had fled before I left, and she ran so fast that I did not overtake her until I was close to Agassiz, where we told the story of our adventure to the Indians who were still enjoying themselves. Old Indians who were present said the wild man was no doubt a Sasquatch, a tribe of hairy people whom they claim have always lived in the mountains, in tunnels and caves. So there's the account by Mr. Point, and again he describes... Very long arms, covered all over the body with hair like an animal, a wide, flat nose that almost covered half the length of the face, roughly double the size of a human. To me, the description given sounds very much like modern accounts of the Sasquatch. And to say that that's something that didn't turn up until the 1950s and that that was completely just a creation that was based on myths about giant indigenous Americans, I mean, that doesn't seem to really hold water in light of some of the historical accounts that we've seen. And it's even stranger to me that over the years I've seen numerous skeptics argue that for such a creature to exist, there would have to be evidence in the historical record. My response to that would be, how much more evidence do you need? But in fact, there's a lot more. There are accounts that have been made by artists who were the first to venture to the Pacific Northwest and who actually traveled with indigenous Americans as their guides. We have accounts from surveyors with companies like the Pacific Northwest Company. We have the stories of miners and prospectors, and many of those, especially toward the end of the 19th and early 20th century, do appear in newspaper accounts. And yes, sometimes hoaxes also appeared in newspapers. But if we look at the sum total of the evidence, the ethnological literature that suggests knowledge of these in Native American folklore, which, in truth, as many indigenous Americans have continued to argue over the years, these things only tend to be referred to as folklore if non-indigenous Americans are the ones talking about them. So with respect to their own accounts, they often say these things are actually real and that these represent true stories in their traditions. But then you pair that with the ongoing reports from over the last century or more, some of which even continue into the present day. And for my own part, I see a very compelling case that anthropologically we should be looking at the possibility, however remote it may seem, that there is and has been a large human-like species that has coexisted alongside us and yet which remains officially unrecognized by science. And so in conclusion, I just want to thank Jason again for putting on this All the Strange event. I hope you are as fascinated with the history of Sasquatch as I am. And I hope it isn't the last time that we all get together and do this. If you'd like to follow my work, of course, it's all available online at micahanks.com. You can find podcasts, articles, and more. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at micahanks. So until next time, my friends, you guys stay strange out there.